Thanks for joining us for our Grace online service. We're so excited that you're able to join us today. Take a moment and let us know where you're watching from. Don't forget to participate in the service. We have online hosts who are ready to engage with you and pray with you, answer any questions you might have. So let's get started. Come on, let's worship the Lord together. See, I was buried beneath my shame. And who could carry that kind? of way it was my turn till I met him see I was breathing but not alive and all my failures I tried to hide Till I met you, but then you called my name, and I ran out of that grave, out of the darkness, into your glorious day. You called my name, and I ran out of that grave. 
you brought us out. We thank you, God. Hallelujah. And you called my name. And I ran out of that grave. Out of the darkness into your glorious day. And you called my name. And I ran out of that grave, out of the darkness, and I'll never be the same, no, I'll never be the same since you called me out. So we praise you today, God, we give you the glory, Jesus, hallelujah.
turn and forget Won't help me say it. You take what the enemy meant for evil And you turn it for good You turn it for good So I'm gonna see a victory I'm gonna see a victory For the battle belongs to you, Lord I'm gonna see a victory I'm gonna see a victory for the battle belongs to you, Lord. And on Christ the Son, rock I stand, oh, ever proud his sinking stand. All other ground is sinking stand. Oh, can you sing that to the Lord? And on Christ the solid rock I stand All of the ground is sinking sand All of the ground is sinking sand On Christ the solid rock I stand join with me in prayer right now. Father, we thank you that you are a foundation. That regardless of whatever circumstance, we can place our life on the rock. And Jesus, you are that rock. We thank you that through you and in you, we don't need to be afraid, but we can stand firm even in the midst of the greatest storm. You are in control. This has not taken you by surprise. And we thank you for that. In the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Hey everyone, I'm Allison and I'm the children's pastor here at Grace Assembly. If you didn't already know, we've been making great content your kids will love. We have something for your littles, kids, and even your middle schoolers. So check out our YouTube page, Grace Kids Indy, or our Facebook page, Grace Kids underscore Indy. We'll see you there. Hey guys, my name is Graham and I get the incredible honor of being the student's pastor here at Grace Assembly. And I just wanna take a minute and let you guys know of a few ways that we are connecting with your students during this time. We've got a couple different social media outlets out there with Facebook, Instagram, and TikTok. And all of those can be found at the handle at Grace Students 317, that's at Grace Students. 317. We've got tons of stuff going on. We've got online devotionals that we're doing through YouVersion Bible app and on Instagram Live. We're meeting on Zoom meetings, which we send those out privately. We've got videos, sermons, we've got challenges all going to all three of those social media outlets. And we would love to connect with you guys. So again, at Grace Students 317, and you can connect with all the things we're doing at Grace Students here at Grace Assembly of God. Thank you for joining us today online. We're so glad to have you with us. I want to say thank you to everyone for your generosity. Uh, a, a big thank you to everyone who's already given online at graceassembly.org forward slash give. Uh, thank you for those who text to give. Thank you for those who mailed in uh, your tithes and offerings uh, this past week. Uh, you, are, you continue uh, to show yourself to be an amazingly generous church. So I just want to say thank you for your faithfulness and for your giving. And just keep it up as we continue to uh, serve people, make a difference in people's lives. And let me just encourage you, uh, if you haven't done so yet, would you help us uh, with Kingdom Builders? Now, we have designated a specific part of Kingdom Builders just for our response uh, to, this, to COVID-19. And so we've had a big demand on our food pantry. We are helping hundreds and hundreds of people. 
And uh, we also realize that in the next few months, there's likely to be a lot of financial needs. And so we want to be in position to help people. So if you would uh, go above and beyond and give a gift to uh, Kingdom Builders Greenwood, we would appreciate that so much. God bless you. There is a zeal in our hearts and a passion in our lives for people to know Jesus. I just want to ask you one question. What does Easter mean? Easter means that sin is costly. The reason that sin is costly is because you can't celebrate Easter without Good Friday. And on Good Friday, the begotten Son of God died. Easter cost Jesus his life. The power of Easter is when we realize how personal all of this is. He was pierced for my rebellion. He was crushed for my sin. He was beaten so I could be whole. Easter is powerful when Easter is personal. Have you ever expected something to happen? And in your mind, you just knew uh, this is how something's going to go down. But then when it actually happens, it wasn't what you expected. Well, that's what we're going to talk about today in our message called Unexpected Victory. Now, if you have a Bible, I want you to go to John chapter 12. And uh, we're going to read the story about the triumphal entry in John chapter 12. And take a minute, uh, if you don't mind, and download the notes that are there, live stream, they're there on Facebook and YouTube. Our online host will help you find those uh, so that you can follow along with the message here today. And of course, uh, today is Palm Sunday, and we're just one week away from Easter. Imagine that. And so I want to encourage you to join us uh, all week long uh, for Holy Week online. And so uh, every day this week during Holy Week, we're going to be online uh, and we're going to take a step-by-step -step journey through the last week of Jesus' life here on the earth. And so each day I'm going to share scripture uh, and we're going to talk about what happened on that day in Passion Week. And then we're going to give uh, an encouragement and a challenge for each of us to do that. So of course on Monday, Jesus goes to the temple he cleanses the temple, and we're going to talk about what it's like to cleanse our temple. And then on Tuesday, uh, he gives what is called the Olivet Discourse. Part of that is Matthew 24 with signs of the end times. And of course, people have lots of questions right now about, are we in the end times? And so we'll talk about that on Tuesday. And funny, the, the scripture doesn't mention a lot about what Jesus did on Wednesday. And so on Wednesday, we'll talk about silence and quietness and stillness. I think that's going to be very powerful. And then on Thursday of Holy Week, that's when Jesus was uh, celebrating the Last Supper with his disciples. And then he experienced the Garden of Gethsemane. And so uh, on that day, we'll remember both of those things. And then it'll culminate on Good Friday uh, as we remember the death of Jesus Christ and his suffering. And uh, we're going to receive communion together. So let me go ahead and encourage you to plan now to prepare to be part of that communion service. Uh, get some crackers, any type of bread, really, uh, or, or grape juice if you have it, but any kind of juice at all. Uh, and I want you to get ready for your whole family to gather around, and we're going to celebrate communion on Good Friday. We're going to do it online uh, in each of our gatherings, our homes, or wherever we're at. But I believe it's going to be a powerful moment for all of us. So I encourage you to join us online all this week on all of our social media platforms. Now, this Palm Sunday and this Easter season is unlike anything that you and I have expected. None of us expected uh, this year for Easter to be online. And we, we are, that's what we're planning for next weekend for our Easter services to be online. Now, let me take a minute and just encourage you that we've taken all of the uh, our team has gathered, we prayed, and we're like, what's the best way to do this? And of course, with the current situation, we thought the safest way 
And the smartest way to do this is to keep all of our services online. But we are planning for a great Easter service next weekend. There's going to be some testimonies, going to be some encouragement, some special music. And I want you to plan now to join us. We're going to have four services online, Saturday at 7, uh, Easter Sunday at 9, 11, and 1 o'clock. And I just think that this Easter could be one of the best that we've ever had. Now, you say, Pastor, how, how can you say that when we're not going to be able to come to church? No, but I think there actually might be more eyes on us, the church, this Easter than ever before. You see, I think people are interested. I think people are hungry. I think people are looking for answers. So I want you to help me not to just pray, but let's invite people to join with us online uh, next weekend. And I believe that it's going to be one of the best Easter's that we've ever had, that more people will hear the gospel of Jesus Christ and more people will come to faith in Jesus Christ. Because actually, uh, God can exceed our expectations. God uh, can do more than we expect. Just like on Palm Sunday, when uh, things didn't happen according to the disciples' plan. Let's look at it in John chapter 12. Uh, We're going to start with verse 12. The Bible says the next day, a great crowd had come for the festival and they heard that Jesus was on his way to Jerusalem. So they took palm branches and they went out to meet him and they shouted, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the king of Israel. Jesus found a young donkey and sat on it as it is written, do not be afraid, daughter of Zion, see your king is coming seated on a donkey's colt. Now, at first, his disciples did not understand all this. Only after Jesus was glorified did they realize that these things had been written about him and that these things had been done to him. Now, uh, it says that they didn't understand uh, all of this, everything that was going on. Now, remember, Uh, These disciples were all Jewish people. And so even as little kids, they they were taught about the Messiah. There were hundreds of prophecies predicting uh, different things about the Messiah. So I want you to understand and put yourself in their mindset. They all had an expectation of what the Messiah would be like and, and how he would come and how he would save them and deliver them. You see, I think that Uh, They expected Jesus to be a conqueror, but a conqueror doesn't come in on a white donkey. He would come in on a white horse. I think they expected Jesus to be a king, just like the the prophet said that that we read just now in that scripture. They, They thought he would be a king wielding great political power, but Jesus never held office. And uh, matter of fact, the civic leaders of his day hated him. I think They expected Jesus to build an army. But if Jesus had an army, it would have been 12 ordinary fishermen and tax collectors and rebels, not soldiers at all. And of course, I think they might have expected that the Savior of the world would come from a royal family, perhaps uh, definitely from the tribe of Levi, the tribe of priests, not from the tribe of Judah, and not from Galilee, and definitely not a carpenter's son. You see, the first Easter didn't happen as they expected. And of course, we understand this a little bit more now because this Easter is also not what we expected. We didn't expect that we would be working from home. We didn't expect that we would be finishing out the school year online. And of course, uh, you didn't expect that your graduation would be canceled. We didn't expect that we wouldn't be able to gather as a church, that all of our services would be online. And many of us never expected uh, to be so affected by sickness and, and by death. And so, of course, this Easter is unexpected. But I think there are some lessons that we can learn from this, this Palm Sunday story about the unexpected uh, and how it applies to us. So here, I think, is the first thing is that I don't think they, they didn't expect suffering 
to be part of their story. They didn't expect suffering to be part of their story. You see, I think they, they thought Jesus was going to show up as the Messiah, and he was immediately going to usher in uh, the kingdom of God as this great leader, this great powerful leader. But, but that's not how it happened. Jesus, on Palm Sunday, would come into Jerusalem, and on Palm Sunday, everybody's shouting, Hosanna to the Son of David, and they're worshiping him. But in just a few days, he would be betrayed by somebody he had invested three years of his life in. He'd be arrested unjustly. He would be beaten. And it, that same crowd that were shouting Hosanna just a few days before would turn on him and shout, crucify him. And of course, that's exactly what they did. Jesus died and suffered on a Roman cross. Suffering was part of the story. And of course, the disciples would suffer as well. Each one of them, after Jesus had resurrected from the grave, the Bible says they gathered at Pentecost, they were filled with the Holy Spirit, and then they went into the whole world preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. But did you know that 11 out of the 12 ended up being a martyr for their faith in Jesus Christ? Only one of them wasn't martyred, and that was the Apostle John. But even John was exiled on the Isle of Patmos, and he was even uh, tried to be killed by being in a pot of boiling oil. You know, I think uh, sometimes when we come to faith in Jesus, we have this thought that suffering's just not going to be part of our lives. That no pain is allowed, no suffering is allowed in our lives. But that's just not in the Bible. As a matter of fact, Jesus didn't promise us that there would be no suffering, but he did promise us that he would be with us when we did suffer. Matter of fact, in Psalm 23, the famous Psalm verse 4, the Bible says, Though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. If you're walking through the valley of the shadow of death this week or even right now, see, our encouragement is that God is, is with us. He's with you. He hasn't abandoned you. He is right there by your side. And Jesus said in John 16, he said, in this world, you will have trouble. Now, how encouraging is that? You are going to have trouble in this world if you're alive. He says, but take heart, I have overcome the world. That's good news, that we are going to have trouble in this life. There is going to be suffering. There is going to be pain, but it doesn't have to get the best of us, but we can overcome through Jesus Christ. And I know some of us have seen suffering more than normal this week. Some of you have uh, been with your loved ones, or maybe perhaps you're suffering from sickness or disease yourself. Some of you may uh, have had a loved one who passed away and, and you've had to say goodbye. Uh, maybe others have lost your job or, or you've been laid off or there's some sort of financial difficulty going on in your life. Tracy and I received a text the other day from one of the medical workers in our church. And she reached out to us and uh, she said, please pray for me. She goes, I just left my shift at the hospital. And she said, uh, she said, I don't know if I can handle this. She goes, in a word, she described it as devastating. I reached out to one of my former neighbors a couple days ago who is a firefighter. He's been a firefighter for most of his adult life. And I just let him know, hey, I'm praying for you, and I just want to encourage you to hang in there. And he responded to that, that he was grateful that we were praying for him. But this veteran firefighter said, he said, this is very hard. Thank you for praying for us. You know, I've been reading in the book of Hebrews lately, and, and uh, just a few days ago, I was reading Hebrews chapter 11. And of course, that's called the Hall of Fame of Faith. And it talks about the faith of Abraham, the faith of Moses, and, and all of these great heroes of the faith and how God had done so many things. And then it goes on to say that, you know, some shut the mouths of lions, but others were eaten by lions. Some were victorious, but some died by the sword. And I was, I, I was looking at that because the scripture says that not all of them saw the promise come to pass in their lifetime, but they had their hope on the future 
on a better promise in heaven. And that reminded me that we need a deliverance faith, but we also need an endurance faith. We need the kind of faith to believe that God's going to deliver us and God's going to save us, but we also need the kind of faith that says that even if He doesn't, we're going to be okay. We're going to stay faithful and we're going to stay strong in the Lord. I think the key is that we don't lose faith, that we keep our hope in God. You see, I think uh, one of the unexpected results of suffering is that, is that it makes us stronger. It makes us better. Remember that verse in James, it says, count it all joy when you go through various trials, because in the end, what it does is it creates endurance on our behalf. You see, somehow uh, uh, we become better through it. And of course, isn't the reason we call the generation of World War II the greatest generation? Weren't they the greatest generation because they had previously experienced the Great Depression? They knew what it was to suffer. They knew what it was to struggle. And yet that prepared them for one of the greatest struggles for the world uh, in in the history of the world. And so I want to encourage you that suffering can actually, good things can come of it. Did you remember that most of the epistles written in the Bible were written from prison? John Bunyan wrote the Pilgrim's Progress from jail. And it was Helen Keller, who was blind in death, who said the world is full of suffering, but it's also full of the overcoming of it. I like that. What a great attitude. Somebody asked C.S. Lewis, why do the righteous suffer? And he says, why not? They're the only ones who can take it. Amen. That's great. And then Pastor Charles Stanley from Atlanta, Georgia, he said, nothing attracts the unbeliever like a saint suffering successfully. Wow. Don't let the fact that you're suffering or that the world around you is suffering to, to make you lose hope. Matter of fact, I, I want to encourage you, let's lean into Jesus during this season and realize that he's with us, that we are not alone, and that through this, he's making us stronger and better and more prepared for the future than ever before. And by leaning into Jesus during this time, instead of giving up, you're actually becoming a light to everyone around you. You are encouraging them. Because after all, it was a result of Jesus, ultimate suffering, and ultimately his death that gives you and I the opportunity to become sons and daughters of God. See, I don't think the disciples expected suffering to be part of the story, but it was. But also, I don't think they expected to be part of the solution. Now, this is interesting because here it is on the triumphal entry. Jesus comes into Jerusalem. And so it's the beginning of this incredible 50, about 50 days where Jesus dies on the cross. And then there is this resurrection that we don't just celebrate next Sunday, by the way, but we celebrate every day because God's power is alive in us. And so, and then after he's resurrected, he spends 40 days on the earth with his disciples. Now, after these 40 days, he's about to go back to heaven and Jesus gives his disciples the great commission. He says, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every nation. And these are some of the last words that Jesus says to his disciples here in Acts chapter 1, verse 8. He said, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the uttermost parts of the earth. Now, he says, you're going to go into all the world, you're going to preach the gospel, and you're going to be my witnesses, and, uh, but I'm going to give you the Holy Spirit to help you. And w- w- right after he says this, boom, he's gone. He goes to heaven. I, I don't want you to put yourself in the, in the uh, mind of those apostles. They were, they were probably looking around like, what? He left us here all by ourselves? Are you kidding me? We're supposed to do what? We thought, we, th- we thought he was going to do this. We thought, and he says, no, the plan is you. I'm leaving this 
commission. I'm leaving this mission. I'm leaving it in your hands. Jesus was saying, you go share the good news. You go preach the gospel. You see, I wonder if the disciples' expectation was for Jesus to just magically appear from heaven when the Messiah would come on his white horse and in their minds dramatically defeat all of the kingdoms of the earth and then he would begin to restore Israel to power and set up his kingdom on the earth. As a matter of fact, that's the exact question that, he, that the disciples asked him just two verses earlier. They said, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? So right there, you get an idea that their expectation was different than what Jesus was actually saying. The disciples probably felt the same way that we do right now. You know, God, why don't you just come and snap your fingers and this whole crisis could be over. Just take it all away and we can go back to normal. We can go back to our normal lives. You see, I think we might already have it figured out in our minds our expectations of what God should do. But I think one of the takeaways uh, that from all of this might be that you and I are part of the solution. Remember, Jesus said, you are the light of the world. You are the salt of the earth. And isn't it only a world that is full of darkness that needs light? The world needs you and me right now. You see, I think it's, it's going to take more than the government to fix this. It's going to take more than uh, first responders. And the, even as good as they are, as great as they are, great medical professionals. It's going to take more than researchers and scientists to be part of the solution. It's going to take all of us. We're all part of the solution. And of course, one way that we can be part of the solution is let's, let's stay at home. Let's follow the directives of our leaders and, and do our part in all of this. But I think another way that we can be part of the solution is that you and I can pray. You know, I think there's probably more opportunities and needs to pray about right now than most of us have had in a long, long time, if not ever. We, we know somebody or we, we see online uh, this need, this issue to pray. And so I just want to encourage you that that's one of the greatest things that you and I can do right now is to pray. And to intercede for one another. And let, let me just encourage you. Uh, when you say, I'm praying for you, actually pray. I've tried to get in the habit of, and, and online, if I see, hey, please pray for this person. I'll just go ahead and type out the prayer right there online. Because they can read it and everybody else can read it too and agree. Because where two or three are gathered, he's there. If the two agree, the Bible says you'll have it. Amen? And so let's pray for one another. Let's pray for our leaders. Let's pray about those who are suffering and those, those who need God's help. Now, I think another way that we can be part of the solution is that, is that by serving people, by just reaching out and, and trying to make a difference. Matter of fact, I think one of the best ways that you can do that is this right here. I had one of the business leaders in our church a couple weeks ago tell me, he goes, this is our greatest tool in our toolbox right now is our phone. He goes, you know, six weeks ago, a couple months ago, calling people, may, they may have thought it was annoying. He goes, now people desperately need people to encourage them and help them. So why not use this tool in your toolbox and call somebody? Call somebody at least once a day. At least once a day, call one person and just reach out to them and say, hey, how can I pray for you? Is there anything I can do to help you? And you know what's going to happen? As you help them, you're going to be encouraged. Now, let me tell you one more idea for how you could be part of the solution. Share your faith. Speak up for the gospel of Jesus Christ. You see, there are a lot of people asking questions right now about life and death. And all of a sudden, the reality of the brevity of this life and the uncertainty of this life and, and, and how fragile all of this is, is really uh, catching people's attention. As a matter of fact, when a crisis happens, that's when people are most open to the gospel of Jesus Christ. So I want to encourage you. Now is the time to be bold, to share your faith, to pray for people, to ask them, hey, how can I pray, pray for you? Is everything right between you and God? Go ahead and have those faith conversations. Now, I know some of you might be saying, Pastor, I can't share my faith. I can't do that. 
But I want to remind you that in the verse in Acts, Jesus said, he says, you shall be my witness unto you. You see, God wants you to be a witness, not a theologian. He's not asking you to be a religious expert. I think he used the word witness for a reason. Because think about a witness uh, in court. A witness says, this is what I saw and heard. You see, being a witness for Jesus Christ is as simple as telling your story. Like the blind man in the Gospels. I once was blind, but now I see. Now's the time to be bold and share your faith in Jesus Christ. Tell your story. Tell what God's done in your life. And remember, Jesus said, I'll give you the power to do it. He says, you'll receive power after the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you're going to be my witness. Now, this is our takeaway here today. I think this is uh, encouraging to all of us. Jesus did not come to get power over people. He came to give power to people. I love that. I'm going to say that again. Jesus did not come to get power over people. He came to give power to people. You might be watching today with all of this going on around the world. You, you might be saying, you know what, Pastor? I can't do this. I just can't take all this bad news. I can't deal with my loved one being sick. Maybe you're a medical personnel or a first responder and, and there's so much stress and, and there's so much expected of you right now. And you may say, I just can't do it one more time. I can't go back to the hospital. I can't make that run. I can't put on that gear every single day. But I, I want to remind you that Jesus said, you will receive power from the Holy Spirit. I know some of you might be thinking, you know, I can't, I can't imagine spending another week at home with my family, much less possibly a month. You know, the Holy Spirit will give you the power to do whatever is necessary. The Holy Spirit is here, and He's ready to come alongside you. Remember, He's not going to leave you, going to forsake you. Even though Jesus ascended into heaven, He says, there's a helper that's coming, and He's going to help you, and He's going to give you power, and He's going to give you strength. Even when you're suffering, he's going to give you power to be part of the solution. All of us, no matter how old you are or how young you are, God's Holy Spirit is there to help. You see, I think one of the greatest things that's going to come out of all of this is that you and I are going to learn again to rely on the power of the Holy Spirit. Because we understand human reasoning, human knowledge, it's not enough. We need God. We need God's help. And I think out of this, you and I are going to get a deeper dependence on the Holy Spirit. As a matter of fact, why don't we pray right now and let's ask for the Holy Spirit to help us, to give us strength, to give us power. Amen? Lord God, we pray in Jesus' name that just what you said in Acts chapter 1, verse 8, that we would receive power. God, we're praying for the power of of the Holy Spirit to come upon us. God, would you reach into that living room? Would you reach into that kitchen? God, would you reach into that vehicle, those people that are watching right now, and let it become the sanctuary of your Holy Spirit. Lord, we need your help. We need your power, God, to, to walk through this valley, to walk through this dark time. And God, we need your power to be part of the solution. So would you anoint us? Would you fill us? Would you strengthen us today in Jesus' name? I pray for every man. I pray for every woman. I pray for every teenager, every child. God, we pray that with you, all things are possible. So God, fill us even now. We yield to you, Holy Spirit. Show us how to lean on you. Show us how to be filled with the Spirit. Help us, Holy Spirit, day by day, one day at a time, to be a witness to be a source of hope, to make a difference in other people's lives. In Jesus' name, amen. You know, perhaps you're, you're watching this right now, and maybe you're not yet a believer in Jesus Christ. And uh, you're kind of, maybe you found us, or somebody invited you to watch this here today, and, and you look around and you see a world that's broken. And all of this is just reminding us that, that life is short. 
And like Romans 3 says that we've all fallen short of the glory of God. And maybe you begin to realize, hey, maybe I'm not as smart as I thought I was. Or maybe, you know, I don't have it all figured out. I need God in my life. I want to invite you to surrender your heart and life to Jesus Christ. And remember, it was through Christ's suffering that makes it possible for you and I to be his sons and his daughters. I want to I'll just summarize the gospel of Jesus Christ. It goes like this. The just and gracious God of the universe looked upon hopelessly sinful people and sent his son, Jesus Christ, God in the flesh, to bear his wrath against sin on the cross and to show his power over sin in the resurrection so that all, and all means you and me, so that all who turn and trust in him will be reconciled to God forever. If you're ready to re- surrender your heart and life to Jesus, I can't think of a better time than right now to make things right with God. So I'm going to ask wherever you are to repeat this prayer with me. Those who aren't right with God and, and maybe even those who already are, just as a, an encouragement in the spiritual realm. Let's speak it by faith, this first step in salvation, this prayer of confession. Pray it out loud. Would you say, dear God, thank you for Jesus Christ, for his suffering and his death and his resurrection. I agree with you that I'm a sinner. I need forgiveness. I'm sorry. I put my faith and trust alone in the cross and resurrection of Jesus. And from this day forward, I surrender. My life is yours. Holy Spirit, would you come into my life and give me all the power that I need to follow Jesus and be part of the solution. In Jesus' name, amen. Praise God. Now, if you're one of those who prayed just now to receive Christ, I want you to do me a favor. Online, there is a uh, electronic connection card, and I'd like you to fill that out and let us know that, hey, today I prayed to receive Christ. Today I surrendered my life to Jesus. If you're on live stream, there's a button there that you can click to, hey, you raise your hand to receive Christ. You can do it right there. And just let us know uh, that you have surrendered your heart and life to Jesus. And so we want to encourage you, and we just want to come alongside you and help you as part of the family of God. Now, let me, let me take one more step and say, if you have any questions about anything that we talked about today, about the message, or maybe you are, maybe you're kind of cynical, or maybe you're considering faith in Jesus, I'd love to have a conversation with you. Uh, and, and so reach out to me. This is my email address. And uh, I, just, I just look forward to hearing from you and starting a conversation uh, about faith, about following Jesus Christ, because it's the greatest decision that you'll ever make in your life. And so we say praise God for that. So everybody who's watching, if you would take a moment and fill out that connection card online, we'd appreciate that. Just let us know that you were here. If you're here uh, online for the first time, we'd love to know that. And just, just say thank you for being part of our online service. Now, I want to encourage you one more time. Join us all week, every day for Holy Week. We're going to be uh, on live stream. We're going to be on Facebook. We're going to be on YouTube every day this week, all leading up to next weekend's Easter celebration online, Saturday at 7, Easter Sunday, 9, 11, and 1 o'clock. And so we look forward to seeing you this week online. So may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May God lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. I bless you in the name of Jesus Christ. God bless you. We love you. Thank you so much for joining us today with Grace Assembly on. Line. Hey, before you guys jump out, make sure you check the comment section wherever you're watching. Your host will give you some next steps. And be sure to share this online. This is a great time to share the hope of Jesus with people that are in your circle. And we can't reach them, but you can. So share this wherever you're watching on any of your social media pages. And be sure to join us next week as we celebrate Easter online on YouTube, 
live.graceassembly.org or on Facebook Live. We'll see you there.